listeners, welcome to today's episode of Talk Wildlife. I'm your host Flo, and I'm here again with our co-host Kevin. Our topic today is going to be, why are we seeing more rats during lockdown? So, let's talk wildlife. So before we start the main topic today, I wanted to talk about something that I saw earlier on, which was quite interesting, and that is that this afternoon when we were eating lunch, I was sitting looking out the window when I suddenly saw what I thought was a dead blackbird lying in the earth. And I said to Kevin, there's a dead blackbird down on the ground. And he looked over and he said, no, don't worry, it's not dead, it's just sunbathing. And I looked again and I noticed that the blackbird was actually moving his head. It was a male blackbird, adult. And I thought it would be interesting for anyone who doesn't know why they sunbathe, exactly why they do this behaviour. Now, obviously, humans like to sunbathe, but I believe it's for very different reasons. Unless, of course, you're doing it to pick parasites out of your feathers. So, Kevin, why do you explain just really quickly why blackbirds sunbathe? Yeah, well, I'll do that. But firstly, it was quite funny, your, your panic level, uh, seeing the blackbird there. And I was so calm, like, ah, it's just sunbathing. And you're like, oh, no. It's because we watch them every day. So to see one of our local blackbirds, what I thought dead, it was uh, quite upsetting. No, I agree. As soon as I took one look, I knew what kind of behaviour they were displaying. Um, so what reason would a blackbird need um, to sunbathe? You know, us humans do it to get a tan or to relax. But blackbirds do it for a whole different reason. So one of the reasons they sunbathe is to help remove ectoparasites. The warmth from the sun uh, is thought to help move the parasites to make it easier for them to um, kind of get rid of the insects and, and you know, kind of de delice themselves, as to say. I've also heard that the heat from the sun can help them to spread their preen oil more over their feathers. So for anyone who doesn't know, birds have a preen gland just uh, at the base of their tail and it looks like this really disgusting, sticky up bit of skin. But they basically peck the preen gland and it helps them to spread oils over their feathers and that helps to waterproof them. So when the preen oil goes around their feathers because of the heat from the sun, it just helps to waterproof them and give them good feather condition and protect the feathers. So the reason behind a blackbird sunbathing is he's taking care of himself. He's making sure he's clean and he's making sure his feathers are in a good condition. Yeah, so if you ever see a bird sunbathing, have a look what they do afterwards. So the blackbird we saw today, as soon as he finished sunbathing, was scratching and preening and eating the little uh, ectoparasites that were all over him. So if you see them displaying this behaviour after sunbathing, you can see the exact reason for the sunbathing in action. I can see though why Flo maybe thought the bird was injured because their wings were spread out, the tail was spread out. It almost looked like they've just fallen from the sky and gone splat onto the ground. So anyway, on to the main topic of today's podcast. I've seen on a lot of Facebook pages and Kevin's heard from a lot of clients that people seem to be seeing a lot more rats lately. And we believe this is linked to the lockdown. So Kevin, first of all, you've been having more inquiries than usual lately regarding people having rat problems. How many inquiries do you usually get and how does that compare to this year? I've just been inundated with rat calls so far this year and it's off off the record from you know I've got stats going back to 2012 really in depth dates times areas where all my my recordings come in from so if you look at the Aprils of 2017 to 2019 I had an average of 12 inquiries for every April um, over that time period. Just in the last two weeks since we started lockdown, I've had 23 rat inquiries and these are the only ones I've managed to get to. I've got many more sitting in my inbox for me to, to look into. So there's been a huge increase. How many do you think by the end of April you will have had? Well, considering we are only on the 10th of April when this has been recorded, if it keeps going like this, it just, I, I wouldn't even care to predict. I think it's gonna be uh, quite high. I think this could be due to two different reasons why so many reports of uh, rat conflicts are coming in. So the first one, I think, is because people are now in lockdown and they're more focused on their gardens. They're around their gardens every day, you know, trying to spend time in their gardens or even in their houses. And I think because people are in their houses and in their gardens more, they're going to notice if there's rats about then if they were at work all day, they wouldn't really notice what goes on in the garden. And secondly, another theory is, and this is only a theory that I've put forward here, is that because there's not as many restaurants or other businesses operating, their food waste is no longer a food source. So I believe these rats now are not finding the food they normally would, 
and I believe they're starting to move through areas. And in fact, one client I spoke to earlier this week even said before I prompted her uh, with my theory that she believed the rats that appeared in her garden had moved over from where a nearby restaurant was no longer operational due to the lockdown. I would have to totally agree with you. And I'd say it's not just because restaurants have closed down. Obviously, there's still some that are open, such as takeouts. But I'd also say it's because the combination of restaurants being closed down and everyone being at home is meaning that proportionally there's now more waste at houses. For example, if you imagine a family of three people, uh, two parents and a child, and the child spends five days a week at school usually, and the parents both spend five days a week at work usually. Now, the child may have breakfast at home, or they may even have a breakfast club at school which they go to, and they'll probably be having lunch at school as well. So that's one to two meals, five days a week, both being had at school, and therefore the waste being generated and stored until collection at the school. And then parents as well. Sometimes parents will have lunch at work or a nearby restaurant or cafe from work or take a packed lunch in with them to work, which again means the waste is disposed of at the workplace. And the parents may have breakfast or maybe even dinner at the workplace as well. And it's also just the fact that families aren't going out as much for maybe picnics uh, in the local park or even just for a cafe for a coffee or just you know, anything that generates any sort of food waste. So what was maybe 50% of the food waste at home before is now nearly 100%. And I think because of that as well, rats are now utilising uh, food sources from bin bags and in the houses themselves. You know, I, I don't think we need to panic. And I would encourage people not to panic. This is um, nothing unusual. These are animals which have been around all the time. They're just being a little bit more obvious coming out in the daytime just because they're hungry. They're going hungry and this lockdown sadly is affecting them too. And I say sadly, I know many people are not fans of rats. I'm a huge fan of rats. They're so intelligent. They're beautiful. They have the most amazing family structures uh, and they're really, really social creatures. So I think we're not seeing more rats. I think we're just seeing rats who are hungry and taking more chances because they really need to find food themselves. I was just about to say actually, most people wouldn't like seeing the rats in their neighbourhoods. And I'd say to anyone who is in that situation, just think that if the rats are more visible because of desperation, it may seem like there are more, but actually it just means that they're more spread about and they're more obvious because they're looking for food and they're more desperate. But the desperation and the lack of food actually means that they won't be reproducing at their normal rate. So you might be seeing them more, but actually it doesn't mean they're more. If anything, it means they're fewer and they won't be having as many young. Another thing I just want to say before we move on from our theories here is if I go over the historical data um, I've collected over you know the last seven years of running my business, we see the most activity in June and July for rats. Um, and again, I think that could be linked to good weather, plentiful natural food, as well as uh, human food uh, waste that rats are feeding on, but also because it's nice weather and people out in their gardens. So again, there could be a, a link there between people using their gardens more and sighting rats more, and also hearing them in the walls of the house and in the loft. So it is quite unusual, according to the data I have, to see this many rats out and about just now. But remember, they're out and about just now because they're struggling as well. I don't know what you think about this, Kev, but I think maybe the really mild winter we've had may be feeding into this as well because maybe that more rats survived the winter. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's that's very possible. Um, surviving the winter, if it's mild, definitely more chance for them to do that. But then again, it will all depend on what food sources they're finding over the winter. That's a time of real hardship for especially rural uh, rodents and um, and even urban rodents. You know, trying to find that food source in the winter uh, can be a challenge for them. So there might not be a bigger boom in numbers because it's been mild. It all depends on what food sources they they have utilised and feed from regularly. And if that food source is consistent. I would have just thought rurally, the ground wasn't frozen or snowed over for the majority of winter, so they probably were more likely to be able to find the food from the ground that they needed. Whereas when it's snowy or frosty, it might be harder for them to do this. Yeah, again, it depends, especially the rural rodents, where they're getting the food source from. If it's, uh, let's say, in on a farm, or you know, someone who's got chickens, they're most likely gonna see um, more rats in the winter because they have to be braver to go and find the food sources. So when people who own chickens are finding the food on the ground, 
um, rats will come up and have that food in the daylight, in the mid-morning, soon after you fed them. They'll learn the routines, um, so they'll take those extra chances to make sure they uh, can find enough food to survive the harsh winters. I found a really interesting article by the BBC entitled Coronavirus, Why More Rats Are Being Spotted During Quarantine. And it quite rightly mentioned that the wandering hungry rats might end up in houses. But I'd say that not only are the houses more important food sources for rats, but like I said before, because people are off school uh, and five times a week people are now eating at home instead, if not more, it's just generating more food waste than ever. And I think this leads on really well to the next point I wanted to raise, which was basically prevention is better than cure. I mean, we heard that many times in life for all sorts of reasons. And when it comes specifically to rats, I would say, for example, if you're putting your food waste out, whether that be your compost bin or, you know, just your normal black bin bag, which may have, for example, packaging, which has got remainder of food in it, it's really important to put it in an enclosed area. So put it in a bin. Don't just put it outside for a couple of days until you can be bothered to put it in the bin or even leave it in your house in a bin bag. Because if rats are getting into houses, they're going to get into that um, food source if it's not properly stored. And so I want to say, Kevin, you obviously know about baiting and snap trapping. You would often say that this merely treats the symptoms of the problem rather than treating the problem itself. You'd call proofing the solution. So can you just explain why you think that baiting and snap trapping are not good ideas when it comes to trying to deter rats or stop rats from coming to your house or garden? Okay, firstly, I would never use baiting or snap trapping. I think they are awful ways for an animal to die then and... They cause a lot of suffering, um, either way that goes round. Now, the thing with uh, baits, so you get these bait boxes with poisons in. Now, what they don't tell you is these poisons are made to be attractive to rodents. They entice them into there. So if they're putting these bait boxes inside businesses, around the outside of businesses, they're actually encouraging the populations to visit these bait boxes. And especially with more and more rodents becoming immune to the effects of the rodenticides, you know, they, especially in the southeast of England, I think the, some of the uh, rats down there, the populations are in like, I think it's around 70%, I think I saw, um, that of the rats they tested were immune to the strongest rodenticides on the market. So these baits are drawing these rats in, if they're immune to it, or if they build an immunity to the poisons, these rats then, as soon as they finish that food, they're going to go and go after your stock, or they're going to go after food in your home, or they're going to be drawn out of the hedgerows and other areas around your business, around your home. So I really don't think they they work as good as they, they, they say they do. And plus, the non-target species that die due to rat poisons in this country is just an untold unpublished story you know if someone wants to look into it and do a study on this I think the results would be quite shocking to be honest. I believe there have been studies but I'm not sure how long ago it'd be something we need to discuss in another podcast episode probably. I did read one study which was actually in the pest control magazine a study in the Netherlands around a I think it was a farm and a factory and they did the tracking uh, test so they had these little pads so when animals went into the traps they could see what species they were and I think it was only about uh, 30 to 40 percent was actually the target species the rest was non-target species and it was birds and even cats trying to get in and hedgehogs trying to get in you know we're talking robins and wrens and we're talking non-target field mice we're talking voles and shrews all these animals shouldn't be put at risk just for their idea of a preventative measure when this preventative measure is actually drawing all these animals into that box. Can I just add to that quickly? When snap traps are put down with bait or bait boxes with poison bait, the real problem with this if you're not proofing your property, although if you're proofing your property you shouldn't need any poisons or any killing method anyway, is that if the animal's still coming in and then they're killed by the snap trap or they eat the poison and they die from that, with all these rats running around looking for more food sources, that does absolutely nothing to stop the next lot of rats coming in and doing the same thing. And that's why preventative methods and proofing are so important because bait boxing and snap trapping does literally nothing to solve the problem. Well, this is my area of expertise, is preventative measures, proofing of buildings. If you are seeing rats outside yours that you haven't seen before, 
then don't worry. All you need to do really is to make sure your home is secure. And that is the key here. The best form of pest control, and I hate using that word because I don't see them as pests, but the best form of pest control is actually stopping them getting into your building in the first place. If they can't get in, there's no risk to your home, there's no risk to your business. And you know, it's just spending time going over the outside of your premises, looking for key entry points, looking for vulnerable spots around pipes, around vents, around doors and windows. If you can build that physical barrier on the outside of your home, there's gonna be no animals coming in the first place. And at the end of the day, rats are a part of the ecosystem. They're part of the, the biological balance of our gardens and of our towns and cities and farms and villages. And they have a place there and a role to play. They, they clean up a lot of our rubbish that we leave about. And so if they're in your garden and they're not gonna come into your home, just be a bit tolerant. You know, they're actually really good fun to watch. But I will stress, make sure your home is secure and then you will have no worry about rats in your garden or around your home. I'll just add quickly as well about the non-target species you're talking about when it comes to the poisons. Now it's really important that if you know of a neighbour putting out poisons to kill the rats or the mice or whatever it is they're wanting to kill, you must make sure that your cats and your dogs are nowhere near the area. Because one of the effects of poisons on rats and mice is that they lose their sense of fear and as they die they're often found just wandering around aimlessly above ground with you know, no sense of fear, no attempts to run away from any predators. And so because of this it's really easy for a cat or a dog to then eat the animal and then be affected by the poison themselves. That reminds me of a story I had from a client many years back. She had rats in her garden, her neighbour spread poison all around the area. Now in her garden she had barn owls visiting and they lived at a tree at a, right at the bottom of the field and these owls had chicks and they caught these rats who were just stumbling and dying everywhere and took them back and now the whole entire family, all three chicks and two adult barn owls, all succumbed to the poisoning. Um, and I know the Barn Owl Trust has highlighted this issue many times. It's sad that people can put poisons down with total disregard to wildlife. It is really sad, isn't it? It's just, I think so many non-target species die as well. And, you know, that's forgetting the target species. It's just as bad for rats. Um, Agreed. Being poisoned is not a painless death. It's, uh, it's horrendous. One thing from the BBC article I did disagree with was a rodentologist, Dr Corrigan, saying that hungry rats can wander quite a distance and end up in a different neighbourhood completely that had no rats prior. Now, I obviously agree with them moving to a different neighbourhood, but I don't think there'd be any neighbourhoods, this was discussing America, but I don't think there'd be any neighbourhoods where there's rats around that doesn't itself have rats. What would you say to that, Kev? Well, I believe anywhere there are humans and humans creating waste, there'll be rats. So I think what he's trying to say, these rats will go to other places where there's food source, there's a food source for them, where there's humans creating waste. But he's saying they'll go to areas where there's no rats. Now the rats ain't going to go to an area where there's no rats and no food source. They're going to go to areas where there is a food source and there will already be rats there. You know, rats have territories. Um, where their food sources, they'll have their own territories in urban areas. So you won't really find an urban area with a ready-made food source for rats being vacant, unless they've all been poisoned, which then goes back to what Flo said earlier on, that if those rats have died, other rats will move in and there'll just be a constant flow of rats living in that territory. I did find it really strange that he suggested there are neighbourhoods without rats, because I just assume that there are rats basically everywhere. Not in a scaremongering sort of way, but just... If there's food waste, there's going to be rats there already. That goes back to what I said earlier on. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they're not there. I suppose if you have a street and everyone puts their bins out on a certain day a week, and other than that, there's no waste problems, you're probably not going to think there's any rats in the area causing problems. But then as soon as the local restaurant shut down, maybe they will see them. So maybe that's what's meant there. The neighbourhood now has rats in it, which didn't before, which I suppose makes a bit more sense. Yeah, I agree. I think as well as the effect on rats, we also have to think about the implications on other urban animals, such as mice, pigeons, gulls, and maybe even foxes. I'm just wondering, you know, what do you think could be the effect on them given the lockdown? Funny you say foxes. I've seen quite a few reports how foxes are actually doing quite well out of lockdown. 
foxes, they will scavenge rubbish and takeaways and other bits of food and, you know, some pigeons and that here and there. But a lot of our urban foxes have a lot of people wrapped around their tail. And well, what I mean by that is they go on their nightly runs when they go to each house at a certain time. So when foxes are waiting at windows for extra uh, treats and tidbits from their, their humans they've managed to... Um, endured by their beautiful looks and having that close contact with nature, I actually think foxes will do all right out of this. Again, mice tend to be in urban areas inside buildings. So if anything, if there are mice in people's houses, I think those mice will be doing quite good for themselves. There's gonna be more people around for a longer period of time. But then don't you think they'll have the same problems, people trying to kill them and bait them? And They will. They're always gonna have those same problems unless there's people out there who want to deal with them in a compassionate way. I think the biggest victims of all this would probably have to be pigeons. Um, I'll just have a quick word about gulls and then I'll go back onto the pigeons. So my first thought with the gulls was that this is going to have a bad effect on them. You know the stereotypical diet of gulls is chips and if we assume for a second that is the only thing they eat, which of course it isn't, with all these places being closed and people not going out to the pubs and bars at the weekend and buying chips at the end of the night, that is something we won't be eating as much of. Although, at the same time, we are still getting takeaways and home deliveries. However, people aren't eating on the street as much, or at least I hope they're not, because people should be where they can, staying at home. However, um, a study in Bristol in 2013 by Bouten et al, um, B-O-U-T-E-N, I assume that's Bouten, found that the gulls they looked at actually spent a third of their time in the countryside scavenging in fields. And funnily enough, even though this was uh, taken, undertaken in Bristol, which is close to the sea, the gulls didn't spend any of their time at sea looking for food. So what I take from that is that if they're not getting as much uh, food from urban areas or for humans, they might be more likely to spend more time in the countryside. And certainly when Kevin and I used to live in the countryside, there were all through the year just thousands and thousands of gulls. So they certainly use uh, the agricultural fields to feed themselves, if not in the cities. Yeah, it would be those um, not mature, non-breeding pairs who would hang out in large groups uh, in the fields all around us. I just love it. Just being, just love being in the countryside and seeing just thousands of gulls everywhere. It's, uh, it's, yeah, I love gulls, love seeing them. So yeah, they do forage a lot in the countryside. I'd like to think that in June we won't be in lockdown. If we are, that's about the time when the gulls will be having their chicks and therefore we might see the effect of them having to find even more food under a lockdown. There's also a really interesting study I found which showed that gulls use human cues to decide what to eat. Now the sample, uh, the sample size of this was quite small. I think it was only about um, 38 gulls. I'll put the link to the study on the description of the podcast on Podbean. But what they did is um, they got a food source and they had one of the food sources handled by a human and then dropped and then they went to see if the gull went to eat it. And then they had another food source which the gull didn't see a human handling and they found that the gulls were more likely to eat the food which they'd seen a human handle. And then they actually did the study with sponges instead of food. So they found that if it was a non-food source, the gulls would still be more likely to go for the item which had been handled by a human. And the reason I mention this is because, again, when it, becomes, when it comes to the urban food that gulls have, they may be less likely to find food if there aren't humans walking around eating it. Although they're so opportunistic, I'm sure that if there's food lying on the ground, they will eventually help themselves. Now, on to the pigeons. I think they are, like I said, the biggest victims in all this. I've already found that people have been finding ill and underweight pigeons. Now, obviously, this happens all throughout the year, but it seems to be happening... Um, more often lately. And I think a large part of that is for the same reasons as gulls, really. When people in the city walk about eating their sandwiches and their snacks and crumbs fall on the floor, pigeons are always there to hoover it up. And a lot of people purposely feed pigeons as well, because although they're quite unpopular, like gulls are, I think they're a lot more popular than gulls. I think because you don't hear of pigeons stealing food from people's hands and things like that, and being a lot smaller, and the fact they're not easily going to do injury to anyone, I think it makes them a bit more popular than gulls. I know a lot of people disagree with feeding pigeons because they don't think that we should be increasing their population because that won't be good for them when there's so many already. And also because it's not always good for a population of a species to rely on humans in case that ever goes away, which is exactly what's happening at the moment. The pigeons in the cities are suffering because the human food source they usually rely on isn't there. However, at the moment, I would say if you can feed the pigeons, please do. 
because this lockdown is hopefully going to be short term and when we come out of it, the pigeons should do better again. But the ones there at the moment who are relying on a certain level of being fed by humans are suffering. So if you can, just to maintain the population at what it is, I would say feed the pigeons. Oh, I totally agree. Um, the pigeons are in desperate need of help right now. And I know there's many groups out there, um, especially on Facebook and other social media platforms, which, you know, help and feed and rescue and rehabilitate their local pigeons. And there's an army of people out there taking it upon themselves to help these birds and they need it. So if you've got a pigeon population nearby on your one walk of the day, your one exercise of the day, maybe just drop by with a little bit of food, just a little something for them to eat, you know, because they might need that extra bit of care right now. Yeah, as I said, I know that people don't necessarily agree with uh, increasing the populations by feeding them more and more. But at the moment, I would say because there's so few people out and about and so few places now open for food, it's not adding to the population, it's just sustaining them in the same sort of way as people stopping the feeding of bread to swans had bad impacts on their population sizes or the health of the populations that still existed. It's not because bread's good for them and it's not because feeding pigeons artificially is necessarily good for them. But when a species or population of a species even has bred over the years because it's used to being sustained by a certain level of human feeding, if that feed feeding suddenly goes away, they're going to struggle. And because they've relied on us for so long, it's only fair that we just maintain them for this time by feeding them until things go back to normal again. Just one more thing I want to add. We were talking about how I've had a large increase in rat calls. Halfway through making this podcast, I had to stop and take a phone call about someone, surprisingly, who has a rat problem. So that just adds to the number I gave earlier on. So that's the end of this episode of our podcast today. It's our second episode. I hope you enjoyed. And again, let us know what you thought, any ideas, uh, opinions on what we said, anything like that. Hope you enjoyed it. And we shall be posting another podcast soon. Bye. Bye.